Okay, and actually, can we all clap at the same time? Can we try? One, two, three. Okay, perfect. <laughs> now, let me just check this out. This is like, I, it, af after every single like post-edit session. I only heard one clap, so that's really <laughs> okay, good. Okay, that's good. Excellent. Welcome to the Speakeasy with Kate Wand, a safe space to discuss liberal ideas. So it's a true speakeasy session. I'm glad that uh, all three of us are here. Uh, we all have been dealing with different things going on, um, you know, personally, professionally, and in the world at large. I've actually been taking quite a big break from social media and just kind of being on the periphery because I've actually been busy in my real life. And it's been nice. It's been a nice break because war is breaking out and all this kind of thing. And then there's propaganda. And then it's hard to tell what actually is going on. Like, do you guys know? Any inside scoop? Let's go. <laughs> I don't know how one would go about knowing what is going on because there's so many conflicting stories and fake narratives and, you know, these, these staged kind of crisis actor events, whether we're talking about COVID or any of the other things that are meant to occupy our attention. So I find it that, that, like you, I increasingly ignore most of what appears in, certainly in the mainstream yes. media. You know, I feel these days like just getting together to talk is like, um, it's a heretical thing to do, regardless even of the content of what you say, <laughs> just the gathering to speak, it feels a little like you're about to break a law or something. I mean, that's kind of the state that we we find ourselves in. And, and Nick, to your point about like, how would you even know what's going on? I find myself so often these days thinking about history. And I, I've always been interested in history. And, you know, when I took philosophy, yeah. I specialized in ancient philosophy and so interested in the past. But with all of the, the the obstacles to even knowing what's going on elsewhere in the world these days, it makes you realize how much information is just perception, right? It's really just data that comes at you filtered through another person. And that filtering process is creates something that's more or less uh, allegiant to the truth. And then it makes you think about what's in our history books and, and it not so much being fact necessarily, but literature, right? It's an, it's something written by a person that is there, that person's take on what happened. There's something beautiful about that because it's a it's a it's a perspective, a human perspective on an event, but there's always going to be a filter there that we have to look at with um, a bit of a bit of skept healthy skepticism, right? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean there's also the difference between propaganda and perception. You know, where propaganda is, mm -hmm. uh, we are purposefully misleading you and, and creating a story mm -hmm. that is not true, you know, that is basically a false story that might use pieces of truth or things that resemble truth. And I think that that's a lot of what we've been seeing in the last two years. And so now how I look at this from macro perspective is, well, we've shifted over from the COVID story, because, you know, even if you look at election cycles and things like that, you have in the States, well, there's something coming up. So people are getting tired of COVID. But wait, we have a new crisis that we need to all <laughs> rally around and, and we need to get involved in this. And that's not to say that there are not people suffering in Ukraine and mm -hmm. in Russia and that there aren't conflicts. Um, but I wonder how much of this... Uh, is happening in a timely fashion uh, for, for, you know, for what purposes? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example of how real crises that can't be used in this way are ignored. Right now, there's an incredible famine emerging in southern Madagascar, which you know, could quite easily in a very short period of time wipe out more people than COVID and the Ukrainian crisis combined wow. by some margin. Have you nope. heard of that? Which is to your there point. You <laughs> wow. Yeah. So what's going on? Why is, why is yeah. this happening? 
it's it's lockdown induced. You've got a poor country um, doing the the whole gamut of all the malarkey that's been visited upon the world in the in the COVID crisis. And guess what? When you do that in a country that doesn't have a social security or social welfare network, mm -hmm. people simply die. It's interesting because um, I think looking at the Ukraine situation, we might think that one of the things that's captured our attention is the, you know, the, the concentrated, punctuated amount of suffering. And so we might be led to think that suffering in and of itself is interesting or attention grabbing or pulls appropriately so on our, our empathy and connection to other people. But the story you mentioned, the situation in Madagascar, Nick, suggests that suffering in and of itself is not interesting because it happens all the time. It happens every day in a variety of different ways, whether we're talking about starvation or the loss of homes or physical harm or mental abuses at the hands of one's government. I mean, suffering in and of itself does not attract the world's attention. So then it raises the question, well, what does get our attention? And it, it seems very clear to me that um, over the last little while anyway, we look where we're told to look. And we mm. look for how long we're told to look for. And in the way that we're told to look at that thing. And I think we've, we've, real, we've realized how powerful journalists are. Journalists may be the most powerful people in the world. I think you could make an argument yes. to that effect. Um, not because yeah, they... Well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> because I think most of them are now led by the nose. They, don't, they aren't really independent or making any decisions about what they cover. If you look at the ownership of media, it's become a, you know, a bullhorn for powerful vested right. interests. So I think they're the least powerful people. They don't even know a lot of the time in order to rationalize their way into some sense of self-worth, they don't really even realize that they're being mm -hmm. led in this way. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good point. It's kind of, again, the, the banality of evil right there. So they just think like we're trained. Yeah. This is what we have yeah. to do, you know, and I actually mm -hmm. saw on Facebook a couple of months ago, it was like, here's a job that might interest you. And it was journalist for CBC. It just popped up in my feed and I laughed so much. <laughs> and I went to go read the description. And basically the description is, uh, you need to be good at parroting whatever we tell you to say. So we have a bunch of experts who will give you your opinion <laughs> and you need to be able to write well enough, have a good enough sense of grammar and look good on camera. And that's basically mm -hmm what it is. So you're right, Nick, in that sense, it's not people who really have a lot of power. But I understand what you're saying as well, Julie, is that they're, they have kind of a, um, they, they, they're used as tools, maybe, for mm -hmm. people who have a lot of power, but without understanding that they're tools. And that's even more dangerous, mm -hmm. because they don't, they don't understand what they're doing, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Or that what they're doing is, is harmful. Mm. A, a, a perspective shared with me was that a lot of journalists don't, don't really write for the public, they write for other journalists. And it's kind of a peer group approval process that goes on. And if the journalists themselves are being subject to this sort of mass psychosis, then obviously they're going to write to seek that approval of the other journalists who have been psychosed. And I think that plays into the story as well. It's not all mm -hmm. down to editorial control. There's, mm -hmm. This narrative control is very powerful. And um, I, I guess <clears throat> my first-hand experience of it, or original first-hand experience of it was in the investing world, sitting on the boards of companies that are involved in um, uh, promoting consumer goods. Um, you know, in some languages, there's no distinction. There's no different word for propaganda and for advertising. It's the same word. <laughs> and um, there's a lot th th that is, I think that's a better way of thinking about the world that uh, advertising is propaganda. So, you, you know, we, I would, I never cease to be amazed at how the kind of marketing people will sit there saying, well, let's talk about the brand's qualities. Do you, is this the brand of the adventurous person or of the the easygoing kind of uh, fun-loving person, hmm. 
And as soon as somebody's asking that question, you know, you realize that this is just propaganda because it's not, there's no, there actually no, there are no qualities of the brand. You know, the brand might be whatever, a handbag, okay? Um, and the handbag is made of leather and it's uh, either good quality or bad quality and it's either nice color or not so nice color, whatever. But um, the, the attributes that they're assigning to it are chosen to manipulate, not, not to reflect anything essential about the product. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's exactly what propaganda does too. It's to manipulate people towards a political agenda as opposed to a commercial one. You know, that's the distinction in, in English. Advertising is manipulating people towards a commercial agenda. Propaganda is manipulating them towards a political agenda. But apart from that, the techniques are very much the same. This wouldn't be such a problem if we had some awareness that this was going on, right? That uh, I, I think one of the things that, that journalists and advertisers have in common is that there's, there's a lack of transparency but that can only cause a certain kind of harm if the people that they're targeting believe that they're being perfectly transparent about the, mm. the data or the product that they're trying to sell, right? And it's very, um, there's a lovely metaphor that comes from, well, John Locke and some of the 17th century empiricists, and they talk about this veil, right, between the perceiver and the real world. And that's supposed to make an epistemological point about how, you know, you're looking at the mug in the room and, well, it kind of looks blue, but that's always going to be mediated by my senses. But when we're talking about something like journalism today, um, I think we have this perception that there are things going on out in the world, like in the Ukraine, and the journalists will just, in an unbiased way, deliver like little vehicles the mm. data from that event to us um, but they're always they're always going to be a, a mediating force in the way that that veil between that curtain that's drawn between us and the world and and we're so much less likely to get into trouble if we just realize if we're aware that 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 you know journalists are also people who have perceptual mechanisms and also, for beyond that might be this part of this larger propagandistic machine. Um, but I think that there's a, a great deal of naivete right now and, and trust and belief in the, um, in the power of media, not only to offer us information about the world, but to improve our lives and to, to even, I would even go as far as to say we believe that it will make us good people. I mean, people on the right, it's very important, I think, as part of their, sorry, people on the left, it's very important as part of their virtue signaling to make it clear that they follow things like CNN, right? And they would never want to be associated with Fox News or certain al al alternative media sources, right? And, and, and part of maintaining that image is, and part of the importance of maintaining that image is that it reflects out into the world the kind of character you have, the kind of person you are, the qualities that you offer, you know, the human race. And so it's very interesting to me that, you know, journalism and media um, have this, this moral dimension to them that has become a, an essential part of your ticket to participate in the human race in the right way these days, whether we're talking about the COVID uh, situation or the Ukrainian situation or other geopolitical things going on. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, Julia. And there's a lot to unpack in there. But one thing that you were talking about kind of at the beginning of, of what you just said is that people expect journalists to report based on facts, which basically means just using reason, you know, and we know that human beings are not rational beings who walk around like that's that's a higher sense that you have to tap into and develop and sometimes make choices that go against your mm -hmm. emotional reaction um but but they are incentivized to not report based on reason because reason doesn't sell a story you know emotions do and so they are operating mm -hmm. from an emotional standpoint more than maybe even your average person. Like they live in the realm of emotions and they don't really li live in the realm mm -hmm. of facts, at least modern day journal journalism. That's what we're seeing. So <clears throat> I think that 
This is what we're seeing with the Ukraine narrative as well. Like it's very, it appeals to people's emotion and probably the journalists themselves, like they are in that mindset, like the same as, you know, when you go into a hospital during the COVID era, how all of the doctors are kind of rallied behind this mindset that they're heroes and that they're helping and that they believe that they need to wear all of this PPE that, you know, two years ago wasn't doing anything to protect them. Like it's a very similar thing where I imagine that they have a certain mindset when they go into something that is, is, is actually detracting any, any potential to be objective and, and look at what, what is actually going on and then report that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at the same time, this is all happening in the current environment. <clears throat> After a very extended period of time during which media outlets have been hollowed out as their business models started taking strain in the face of the online and social media uh, mm -hmm. phenomena. So a lot of the outlets really don't have a great complement of investigative uh, yeah. journalists or war correspondents or photo journalists. And I think that goes a long way to explaining why we see so much obviously fake material where within a few minutes of something being published, even by one of the more reputable or better known publications, somebody on social media is pointing out that that photo that you claim comes from a COVID ward in India actually comes from the chemical spill, you know, 17 years ago. Uh, it's, it's the same picture. Um, and, you, you know, th there's that lack of competence to actually go and retrieve facts, even if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So they echo. And and, and who provides that picture? Like, this is what I want to know as well. Like, where where does that come from? Is that part of the kit? Like I was talking about before, where like, you know, we'll give you some information by experts and this is what you'll report about. Is it, here's a picture, guys. This is what happened. Talk about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think you'll probably find that there are more uh, mechanisms of control than you care to count. <laughs> but we had we had a funny one today. There's a, a newspaper that we've um, been criticizing for its COVID correspondence and pointing to their funding as being one of the causal mechanisms of, of them adhering to this increasingly ridiculous narrative. And to, to of course, the one funder would be the Open Society Foundation. And uh, we said, yeah, your, 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 your talking points always seem to echo those of the Open Society Foundation. Can we at least have a disclaimer, you know? Well, today they published an article that was not just echoing the talking points, but actually written by George Soros himself. Hmm. Yeah. And you kind of look at that and say, okay, is, is nobody else seeing this? Is this... Uh, yeah. Can, can we now just rename this thing, the, the, uh, the, open, the Open Society Foundation newspaper and well, realize, you know? So this is really interesting to yeah. me, Nick, because I think you're raising, um, what you're touching on here uh, has to do with the distinction between fact and value. And I'm noticing that, um, you know, in, in our um, parliament in Canada, well, over the last couple of weeks and back when the Emergencies Act was invoked. And then there were discussions within the House and, and in the Senate about where the liberal point of view is coming from. And then there were accusations that certain MPs were actually supported, shall I say, by the, by, um, the World Economic Forum. And to many people, that counts as a clear accusation of some sort of wrongdoing. Right. Because it's it's clearly nefarious to involve that kind of organization in national politics, I might say. But other people, upon hearing that, will say, well, I'm sure, that's fine. But either the WEF is really not that involved in Canadian politics, or if they are, what's wrong with that? Because mm. we have other international organizations like the UN and they really just seem to be doing good things. So, so what's the problem? 
Um, so it seems like there's this question about fact, about which organizations are um, united with one another, involved with one another, whether there are, uh, I don't want to say conflicting interests, because then that's reading value into the fact question, right? But where there are interests aligned or involved. And then there's a further question about whether or not that's good. And we seem to have trouble agreeing not just about the fact, but about the value mm. right now as well, right? Um, and I don't know, that's why, I mean, in our country right now, Kate, you probably have this sense as well, that a lot of anti-narrative people are rejoicing at the lifting of the mandates. And they feel like, oh, thank goodness, what a relief. I'm so glad we can get back to normal. We can go to restaurants. That yeah. COVID craziness is gone. And, um, you know, I don't think that's going to be true. And we're yeah. very likely to <laughs> coming back in the fall, if not work. Intermittent that. reinforcement. Um, but what I think... <laughs> Yeah, but what I think is important about um, the situation is the factors that got us into this place to begin with, not particular mandates about particular vaccines, right? But um, the views about politics and democracy that allowed this to happen, the geopolitical influences mm -hmm. in particular um, national governments that allowed this to happen, and probably most importantly, the psychology among the people that will, I think, in my view, allow anything to happen. Yeah. Um, go yeah. ahead, Nick. Um, we're both we both want to say something, but you go. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you line up to tell me how I'm wrong, Nick. You go ahead. Nick first. <laughs> Nick is trying to be more contrarian on the speakeasy because. We realize like we have a lot of similar opinions. So, you know, this is oh, and maybe the three of well. us do as well, you know, <laughs> to be transparent to the audience. And I'm sure that they realize this already, but but we can try we can try and But he's thinking hard about <laughs> Julie must be wrong. How is she wrong? Let me <laughs> I think I wasn't actually lining up to, to critique what you were saying. I was lining up to add to it. <laughs> um, so maybe I need to put my, my um, criticism hat back on again after that. Um, but um, the, the, the story for me is really one of uh, the, the world is sort of divided into a camp that goes with whatever government puts in front of them government and the media, which are basically indistinguishable at the moment and have been all around the world for the longest time now, you know. So there's a camp who really believe that the government's looking out for them and that, yo, know, this is where we had Fauci and all that kind of stuff. And then there's a camp who's kind of taken the view, no, um, there's propaganda all around us. There has been for many years. This is just, uh, th this COVID story is just another instantiation of a crisis inflamed in order to achieve political aims that are, are not in our interests. And that for me is the divide. All the other divides are artificial. I've, for the longest time now, I've not bought into the construct of left and right. I've, I've, I've believed that that was a artificial construct imposed. Mm -hmm. um, that the real political dichotomies lie, lie elsewhere and that left and right are these two nebulous and more or less meaningless labels that are flung around. Um, for the longest time, I've believed that uh, conservative versus liberal were, was a false dichotomy also imposed. And so if, you, if, you, if you're sitting in my kind of position, you see COVID as, as I say, one instantiation in a sequence of largely fabricated crises used to propel the world, world in a certain direction. And the feeling for me of COVID was like that from the beginning, February 2020. It was amazing how the hysterical narrative took hold so quickly and departed almost immediately from any fact that you could find, <laughs> you know, anything. And the entire narrative became bogus. I don't think there's any element of the kind of received COVID narrative that I would regard as true, any important element, you know. And so that, that's where I live and a bunch of my friends. Some people got converted halfway along where they eventually this thing got so ridiculous that they, they couldn't take it anymore and they'd gone with the government story and then they kind of get, as they say, red-pilled. You know, that's the word that's, 
that's used mm -hmm. and, and they come across. And there's another group who it's just terrible what's happened, you know. Governments have done everything. So the fun help. fundamental divide yeah, that's the divide. The fundamental divide you think is, is over whether or not you think government is good. Well, yeah, whether whether governments are, good. are good to the citizens or, or whether they need to be kept a watch over. And and the reason I'm saying all of this yeah. is journalists I think a lot of them 30 years ago would have said to you their job is to keep the government mm -hmm. in check. Uh, I don't think many of them feel that way at all now. Their job is to promote the good things that the government is doing for the citizens of the country. Well, if you're right, and I think there's very good reason to think you're right, the um, you know the other phenomenon that I think has gotten us into this is the belief that it's better to let someone else think for you. Yes. Right. And um, we've had very, very smart, uh, well-respected economists and, you know, people like Cass Sunstein and, and none of this is hidden, you know, this, the, the nudge um, model that was created at the WHO that's now followed, you know, by Canada and I'm sure many other countries. Um, <laughs> and and it's often to, you know i mean it, it's it's sure it's defended by public health officials like our our teresa tam but i find often when the average citizen hears about this because it's written about now and again there's an article in the toronto star about it you know it's not really terribly hidden but when the average person hears about it they think that seems right you know i mean surely experts people who know things about immunology or cardiology or agriculture or finance surely know more about those things than I do. Therefore, why shouldn't they make decisions about those things that pertain to my life? So I think this idea, Nick, that, you know, we have this belief that government is good and that other people should think for us kind of are working hand in hand, aren't they? Are, you know, and, um, the, both of those ideas came out of the blue to me. I, I thought we were skeptical yeah. of politicians for a long yeah. time. I thought we liked to think for ourselves, even when we make mistakes. I mean, I don't know what pile of sand up my head was buried in, but those two, you know, those two things really just well, came out of the blue to me. I don't think they have been out. I think they, you know, have been in, sort of insidiously. Yeah, I think. I think time, Julie. But, I was reading, I don't know, Jane Austen at the time, and so I didn't know. I think that where me. some of these things are coming from, and I don't understand it completely, but I think that it has something to do with the rise of patern uh, paternalism in government, and that has been also mm -hmm. aligned with a society that looks towards experts more and more over time. And I don't really understand exactly how, but it seems, you know, bigger, growing government, and then maybe it has to do with having all kinds of people who are um, getting paid to think in a sense, right? Like, um, which you didn't have necessarily 150 years ago. So you have bigger governments and then you have all of this government funding put towards academia and put towards ideas and getting paid to think and getting paid to manage the population. I don't know, like, is there something there maybe? Is that well, I mean, we have certain kinds of thoughts that are incentivized now. I mean, when it came to implementing mandates at universities, I mean, there were in Canada, um, uh, you know, f um, funding given to promote vaccine right. uptake, for example, right? So you would get more money if you were more successful at propagating that particular thought. So, and I, I, I don't think we've been quite so... Um, explicit about incentivizing certain values in the past though i would have to think a little more about that don't hold me to that yeah kate i i think you're being overly generous with the term paid to you. <laughs> um when i when i look around at the universities these days i i mainly see people who i can only interpret as being paid to be deranged and um it's it's you know to me to 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 accord the, word, the thinking is a respectable term. We, we, we need to we need to give it um, you know some 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 respect and right. reverence. And what it passes for academic thinking 
is, is so far away from what I would have got as critical thinking and so deeply plugged into a morass of almost anti-realism, uh, some form of relativism or jingoism or, uh, uh, you know, the, these words are becoming tired because people use them so often, virtue mm -hmm. signaling, political correctness. Um, it's, it's quite disturbing uh, that, that this, th these institutions that once had name, that commanded respect, seem to be saturated with the very antithesis of thinking. They don't think, they absorb a political kind of perspective and then repeat it and shout it and squelch the opposition right. and squander the opportunity to debate okay, well, and to learn something I think new. I think that where that may come from is um, you look at the fall of Soviet empire, right? And then what happens is maybe somewhere behind closed doors, all of these ideas need somewhere to go, right? And, and where are they going to go? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yes. academia... And no, we, we, need to, we need to keep, you know, these ideas. And then you have neo-Marxism that kind of develops. And now, you know, it's just, it's just changed. It's, it's, it's evolved into something different now. You know, where, you know, okay, now we're moving more this way. Now we're going more into transgender ideology. And listen, I have nothing, obviously none of us do, I know, have anything against any individual and their choices. But it's that this is like becoming um, uh, ready-made ideologies where you can just flop your, um, flop your, your own undeveloped self into, you know, like there's no, because uh, there's, there's less uh, emphasis on people putting time into introspection, developing themselves, figuring out who they are. It's like, here's some ready-made ideologies for you. And, you know, we've got this, we've got this under control. And then what do we have now is all of the same people who are now in the winter of their life, who are really trying to crack down hard and control everything because it's it's drifting away from where they want to go. So they're trying to pull everybody back towards the center. I love I love what you're saying, and it, it reminds me. I, I had a question that I want was reserving for Julie when I walked in the room. Devious <laughs> man that I am. Um, I, I I look at these trends that that you're speaking about, and how often this concept of personal identification comes up. And I have had this reservation about the phrase, I identify as, almost since the first time I heard it. Um, and I wanted to actually pose uh, a, 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 an objection to the phrase to Julie, because she's a, got this profound philosophical uh, background and probably understands the technical aspects of this much better than I do. But my objection to it is, you know, to, to identify as anything that you aren't, in some kind of very robust and realistic way is a very odd thing to say because it, it involves the apprehension of another entity's qualia. You, that you, you, you assume the position of knowing what it is like to be something else and then confidently stating that you identify, which is to say equate yourself with that other thing. But unless there's been some reinvention of the science of telepathy, <laughs> how do we how do we begin to start with the statement I identify as doesn't matter what it is. I mean, for all I care, you know, e even the statement that I could make some pretty bland statements. I can say I am a South African. OK, well, that's close enough because as a matter of fact I was born in South Africa inside the geographical region but to say it then it becomes a meaningless statement I, I could just say I was born in South Africa I don't have to say I identify as a South African 
So it, it almost falls away as an intellectual consideration. If I say I identify so as a 10 year old, you can say, but you're not one. Or you can say, oh, but you were a 10 year old once and you sort of knew what it was like. So you know what it was like to be, or you remember what it was like to be a 10 year old. But you kind of get stuck on the fact that I'm clearly not a 10 year old, you know? So th this is also a, a, a fault. It's a different species of bad thought from the first one. And then you get the thing where I can say, yeah. I identify as a Pakistani or a black person or a woman or something that I'm quite clearly not. Mm -hmm. That's another species of bad thought. But to me, the phrase itself is, is a non-starter. I can't find anything to come after the little phrase, I identify as, that makes the construct valid or sensible. And it sort of is so at the heart of what is going on in the zeitgeist, in the culture, that I, I, I kind of program myself to come in here and say, Julie, help me out with this. Help me out with this enigma. <laughs> There's so much like yeah, I saw me go because there's so much in this. <laughs> there's so much. Um, so first of all, I think what you said first, I am a South African is very different from saying I identify as a South African, which I think is part of your point. Right. Because I am a South African is either true or false. Mm. It admits. Mm. Right. It's binary. You have to define what it means to be South African, and if by that we mean that you have that birth, then it's you know it's it's just a question of fact. But to say I identify as a South African implies, I think the point you're making is that I'm not one, but I will act as though I am one. So it's it's a kind of false making, right? And the word identity is like it's a kind of equivalence, right? So if I am identical with my coffee cup then what I mean by that is that I am exactly the same as my mm. coffee cup. We share all the same properties and the same essence and all of that, which clearly I'm not, right? So I think you're, it's very interesting because the grammatical structure of the phrase I identify as contains within it the idea that you are not that yes. thing, but you're trying to make yourself yes. synonymous with that thing. And then you brought up the word qualia, which we should spend a minute on just in case people who are watching are like, what is this? Is this an English word? What is this? Um, and qualia is like this, the, the subjective experience, the what it is like to be a thing that that is part of the private theater of the mind, right? That no one else can really know. You and I can talk all day and learn all kinds of things about each other, but I will never know what it's like to be Nick and Kate, and you will never know what it's like to be me, right? So that is something that if you are trying to identify as a Pakistani, as a woman, as a coffee cup, whatever it is, right? You try as hard as you might, you will never really know what it is to be that thing because you can never gain access to the subjective experience of that of that other thing, right? Um, so why do we, I, you know, I'm always so interested in why do we do this? Why do we want to identify as a thing that we're not. And, oh, I should back up a little bit because, because it's containing a falsehood of some kind, as soon as you identify as another thing, there's that's signaling a kind of mm. schizophrenic moment. Or at least an unhappiness. You, right? Um, there's a break, or at least an unhappiness, but I think at your core, your mm. identity is mm. broken or it's split over these mm. two different things. And so there's a question of integrity because integrity right, has to do with the mm. wholeness of a system and the identity of parts within a system mm. or the cooperation of those parts within a system. It's not clear you can have integrity, that you can be a whole person if you are identifying as something that you are not. And then to get to the point, well, why would we do this? Maybe, maybe um, Nick, to bring up your point about happiness, because, because we're not happy, because we're not fulfilled being the thing that we really are. So we think we'll look outside of ourselves to try to make ourselves whole when we don't feel whole. Well, why is that? Why did we get into this place? Why do we have this kind of 
existential crisis where we aren't enough. And I don't know the answer to that, but I do think it's a very common malaise of the postmodern era. It's what, mm. And the falling away from purpose, you know, it, it, in general. I, I actually Sorry, read it as a sign that there is actually some validity to the idea that we need a new normal. If there are that many people out there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who are so obviously disturbed with who they are and, and, and the position they find themselves in life, that they're prepared to make that statement, I identify as whatever, or they feel compelled to make it, or, you know, it's so, it, it's like this, this really important thing that needs to get a lot of attention from other people. There must be a large fuss made about it. We must, uh, I, there must be a lot of external validation of the perspective. Mm -hmm. If we're in that position. And is this why we're, is this why we're all apparently so hung up on tribalism and collectivism right now? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know in this question of identity, we're talking about sort of the sexual identity issue and all of that, but, um, is our interest in being part of a group the fact that we don't feel whole in and of ourselves? We, we have no interest in being autonomous because we're not comfortable in being alone and being with ourselves and being in our own skin. So we need some, we need to like outsource our identity making, right? So we think, well, group, where's the most, you know, come on, give it to me. I need, I, I can't do it for myself. So I need to be made by you. So I'll identify as belonging to your group. And what I'll get in return is an identity and essence, purpose, and all the right lingo and beliefs and ideology. Yeah. It's mm. kind of like you can yeah. buy a kit, right? Plug, <laughs> you can in, buy a, plug in meaning, like, meaning um, and purpose. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I think meaning. this is, it, rem right. it reminds me of um, a kind of debate that Nick and I have ongoing, Julie, which is, you know, I always argue that if you have a kind of socialist or communist uh, structure in your family of origin, that that will ripple out to the rest of society and that you'll end up with a government that is, you know, completely centrally controlling everything because that individuals and their behaviors and then the family around them and then their friends, and then everything else, you have this ripple effect. Whereas Nick believes, and correct me if I'm wrong in explaining this, Nick, that mm -hmm. you you can have kind of like more of a, you know, a communist model in your family. And he argues, you know, I pay for the health care for all of my children and my wife. You know, uh, I distribute the, the fruits equally amongst them, you know, because my my... 10 year old doesn't make a living, I'm not going to give him less uh, health care than, than myself. Um, but he says, you know, as you go up, you should have more of an almost an anarcho government when you're looking at like world government it should become, you know, less control going upwards. But if if my yeah. theory is sorry, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so the, and the key point in all of that is for me, optimal political organization is scale dependent at at a small at a small local level we we do have we do get more benefits from partisanship and tribalism and collectivism the social uh greater good kind of all this whole cluster of ideas right we we, we derive more benefit from from being social animals at uh, a small local level than we do at a very macro level where we're talking about billions of people at a time and so for me optimal organization of my household is indeed communist or extreme egalitarian kind of structure when i go out of my front door into my neighborhood it's pretty socialist i don't if, if, yeah, i'm going to help somebody living next door to me if they've got some kind of crisis that they cannot afford to address and as I go out into the city, I become a little less convinced that I really want to solve the problems of the whole city and kind of inclined to, to say, well, let's, let's be more humble about how much of this wild beast we can contain. By the time I've got up to the level of the nation state, I kind of want to know that 
there's a limited set of things that the guys in the capital city are working on because it really does make sense that you need to address them at a higher level of uh, organization. Perhaps that would be administration of things that have high fixed costs. So a law system or um, a military system or something like that. Things that require um, order and, and coordination. And then by the time I get up to the World Health Organization and uh, the WEF, I say these guys should be making no decisions whatsoever, have no control whatsoever because they're all daft. Okay. So they think they can manage so before, that complex. So before Julie jumps on this, because I have a feeling she might agree more with me, and we've talked about this a little bit, <laughs> but I just want to get back to kind of what I was going at with this, is that mm. if my theory is correct, which is that that's impossible. That's that's kind of like an idealistic perspective. So if you have, you know, like that would, would be lovely if it were true. And I disagree that your family is communist, Nick, because it's still voluntary. You know what I mean? Like you, nobody's, nobody's telling you to, to tell that to my son. Right. But, but at the same time, at the same time, like they do, you know, they do have a certain choice, you know, even if they're, and you have a choice, which more importantly, you have a choice. Nobody's imposing this on you, okay? And that's, and that's you can have also hierarchy within a household that's normal. And there's authoritative behaviors and there's communist behaviors, which aren't the same thing. But anyways, my whole point here is that <laughs> this is voluntary mm -hmm. still. And that if you have, you know, you look at, for example, intergenerational traumas over let's say the USSR before, you know, they had SARS and it was, is it going to be a good SAR or a bad SAR? You know, they're used to that control. And then it moves to communism. Well, it's not such a far spread. We still have people telling us how to do our lives, how to live, what to do with everything. We still have no control as individuals. And then you move into what we're seeing. We come back to Russia and Ukraine right now. You know, these are not places that are used to having what we would call democracy, right? And people will even argue Ukraine want democracy and all of this. They don't really know what it is. Maybe they know kind of what cronyism is, but they still have a huge Russian influence. So all of that to say that you come back to this idea of fractured individuals who have no idea who they are, what they're doing. I identify as this because I have no idea who I am. My, my, my psychology, my, my psychological self is split, you know, then this of course will be reflected in a society which is fractured, in a society that, that doesn't know who they are and, and feel the need to identify with certain things. And here's a perfect identification is, uh, I've seen this hashtag, Ukraine is George Floyd. Like people are literally identifying, they're, they're, they're saying almost I identify as Ukraine. I identify, you know, as these, as these, ideas that I can't actually be. They're not even, mm. they're not even things, you know, they're, you can't identify as being, being Ukraine, right? So this is, anyways, I'll uh, let you guys can, take the ball, but. <laughs> before, before Julie jumps in and teaches me something that forces me to change my mind, which I love doing, um, let me, let me just try and link those two ideas a bit for you. Uh, to, to try and, because I don't think there really is a massive gap between the two perspectives. You talk about the fractured individuals. So my point would be that the individuals are fractured because there is no local community, no, no uh, sense of being part of something that has meaning outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. The, the rulers or governments who are far away, who don't even know your name, you can't derive meaning from them. And it's that absence of the local mm -hmm. social fabric that this very centralized world has created. When powers to decide how things are going to work are all located in some distant place that doesn't doesn't, it's, they don't only not know your name, they know nobody's name. They don't know any of your detail or circumstances. Whereas in a bygone era, central government was a very small element of the economy, maybe a couple of a percent. And depending on where you lived, the local church community, uh, the congregation, or uh, some other form of local organization 
was more present in your life and the people in that organization knew who you were and knew, knew what your skills and shortcomings were and knew what your opportunities and threats were and uh, your good fortune and your bad fortune, your virtues and your vices, uh, or at least assumed that they did. And I think that kind of environment, which is now more you know, locally socialist, if you like, is, um, is one which helps people to get that sense of meaning and purpose because we are fundamentally social animals. We just stop being That's that not what socialist when... means, though. You know, it doesn't mean no. social. No. Okay. No, I, I, I realize that. <laughs> I realize that. But the kind of... What, what groups do is they act to... They, they act to constrain the individual. We can't get away from that. When you commit to, to a group, when you, when you make long-term promises in, in, in the interests of creating something that, uh, you know, that requires sacrifice, that requires postponement of, of gratification, that requires cooperation amongst people, you kind of do sacrifice a level of rights of individual rights that you, you fa whether it's legally or you know because there's a jackboot about to come down on your head if you disobey or because the social costs of breaching the contract are just too high and you don't want the ostracism um, there is a, a truth to the there being a sense of meaning in being part of a social matrix and of giving up something of the individual, of the atomized individual in that process. It's the ask here at the moment is that you should give that up in the interest of something that gives you no sense of being part of a social matrix as being even you don't even know about known about you become reduced to a number in a spreadsheet or you know and we've seen all these spreadsheets flashed on the television screens you're either in the group of people who died of COVID or you're not but none of those people have names and faces and they're not part of any community it's all this utilitarian calculation that's going on sorry I've, I've now hogged Judy's response to the original question but I'm just getting at the that that atomization yeah, the, the, what you call the fragmentation of the individual. I agree with you, it's there, but I think it comes a lot from an, the absence of local community, which itself is derived from overbearing power in highly central organization forms. Overbearing power and quite possibly information overload and globalism on an infinite trajectory outpacing our ability to cope with it all right um but so i have no idea which one of you is right <laughs> no idea <laughs> i need to think more about it but i do have two um ancient anecdotes to offer on this point of social connectedness and what we lose when we scale, I think. Um, one, one comes from Aristotle, and I've always been very struck by this very small comment he made. And he wrote, he wrote a book called The Politics, as you might know. And, you know, he writes a lot about how humans are political animals, which means they're social, social beings, you know, in the way that bees are, or other sorts of animals that are social. Um, but at one point in the politics, he writes about the, the ideal size of the city. And he says that his hometown was the ideal size, right? Because you could go up on the, it was a mountain, but you could go up to an elevated place and look down and see the whole thing. And I think that he's not making a, um, a topographical point there, right? I think he's saying that in order to be a good citizen, it is important that you know enough about your fellow citizens that you feel a kind of fraternity with them friendship with them and you can't do that beyond a certain scaling right that we can do that with and it's the, the, the smaller number the easier it is to do which is why it's probably easier to feel that kind of fraternity and care for people in your own family group in your own household and then your friend group and then it's a little harder when you 
move outside of that to slightly larger circles. And then it gets harder now. And in, in the city I live in has 400 and some thousand people. I think, well, that's a very difficult number to comprehend. And, you know, it's had massive influx of, you know, people moving. And I, I don't know who these people are, right? And now when you get to the point where pe people live in these metropolitan areas and now we have all of this electronic communication that makes us sort of feel like we're part of a global community but also we especially don't know those people um things fall apart the, the question about exactly why they fall apart i'm not sure right so what was aristotle thinking in terms of what do we need to know about other people in order to care about them in the right ways that's a really interesting question and then plato made a similar kind of point about his just his explanation of where the polis or the city state came from. And he said, you know, it started out with the household. So you have the, the, the man and the wife, and then they have children, and then you get a number of households together, you get a little village, and you get a number of little villages together, and you get a bigger village, and then a number of those together, and then you get a kind of a city state. Um, and so for him, there's this kind of, you know, the, the, the state is metaphorically Plato was like a, a commie, family, but just on a larger scale. Plato was a commie, yeah. That just tells you, it tells you, right. Well, um, no, I know. No, I, I, like, I, I, I love the... I, <laughs> Plato was a smirk. There's a syllogism I, I, I there somewhere. The, I love know? the Aristotelian <laughs> idea. That, that, that sounds like um, pretty much right. I'd have to reconcile the problem of um, mountainous countries having larger cities than flat ones. Uh, <laughs> You can see further. But, um, <laughs> apart from that little uh, quibble, the, you know, th that sounded yeah. like a pretty good story. The platonic one, that sounds like a just so story. What are we doing with, um, what are we doing with uh, this idea that you, you could just continually scale up a family without any consequence? You know, that sounds like a really bad thought. Yeah, well, and that was very a very important sort of idea for him, right? Because when he's writing about why uh, Socrates thought he shouldn't escape from prison after being unjustly sentenced, Socrates says that, well, you know, the relationship between a citizen and the state is an awful lot like the relationship between a parent and a child. So this metaphor of the yeah. family to the state, he takes to be quite quite serious. Right. Now, but it, it is not a great scale, metaphor. You know, the analogs and, are different. Uh, the, the, you're another. nameless to the state. That's it. And I think, Julie, like you said something yeah. that I was thinking about earlier, and you said the right word, fraternity. I was thinking earlier when we were talking about identity, and you said, you know, identity comes from identical. You have fraternal twins and you have identical twins, right? Fraternity means brotherhood. Mm -hmm. It means that, you know, mm -hmm. we are... Uh, we are not the same, but we're very close and we take mm. care of each other. Um, but it's voluntary in my mind. Like this is the difference between how I look at the model of, you know, individualism always has a bad name. And Julie, you and I have talked about this before, is that it's seen as, well, you only care about yourself. You don't have a sense of community. You don't, you know, and Nick, we've talked about this before, where it's like, you know, the individual to an extreme, Right. Mm, mm. But maybe this is the crux. We have, mm. I identify as, like, I need to be identical to, which is, I think, more socialist. Whereas you... Yeah, this is so interesting. Kate, you were talking, we were talking about experts earlier, right? And the prevailing idea now being that, well, some other expert is going to be able to make decisions about me better than I can. And I think the idea that we're all sensitive is too, is that no one can really make decisions that affect me better than I can. I, mm -hmm. I am the expert about things that pertain to me, right? Because someone can advise what surgery is best for me, but nobody will know what it's like to go through it other than me. Someone can uh, advise how I should invest my money, but no one will truly understand what that money means to me or what it felt like to earn it or lose it or what my goals are or, right? So I think there's, there's this, there's the seed of an idea that is so important to what's going on now. And if we could blow it open, it would make a huge difference. And I don't think I, I quite know how to do it all myself, but there's this idea that if you think you know best about yourself, and that you should make decisions about yourself, you're selfish. Mm -hmm. But that's not a legitimate leap, right? I can think that I am best 
poised to make decisions that affect me, that I am a capable critical thinker, and I care about other people, and I'm altruistic, and I know about and feel fraternity with other people. So I think we've created a false dichotomy where there doesn't need to be one, right? You don't need to outsource your thinking on pain of becoming selfish, right? If you, so we can hold on to our altruism and our ability to think for ourselves. And we don't, it's like a, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of phenomenon, right? And I think we've, this idea that we should care for other people, that we should, um, oh, what is the language that's, you know, like fraternity, but uh, we're all in this together, right? Um, it's like if you buy into that, then you must also buy into that. And that's the fact identical. That's that I, I don't think that's no fraternity. That for me is identical. We're all in this together. We are all the same. We must all conform. We must all do things the same way. You cannot even even if you have your mask a little bit lower down, it's still covering your face. It must be right up to your eyeballs, like everybody else. It's identical. Can I? Yeah. Can I? Um... Well, we. I, I was just saying we, we we've done this since. I mean, how long have we done this for? I mean, the, you know, the Roman gladiators. We we wear the right colors of our home team. We, uh, and then in very subtle ways, you know. I mean, you think even about fashion now, and um, I mean, I'm a little out of touch with this, but there was a time. Not too long ago, a few years ago, when the fashion was for undergraduate girls to wear gray track pants with one pant pulled up and the other one pulled down. <laughs> You're going to think this is silly, but not to do that. Nick, did you do you know about this? <laughs> it's not as frivolous as it sounds because failing to do this loses your membership in that important social group. That is just the modern precursor of Roman gladiator teams and uniforms, right? We, we've always done this. We, 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 there are all these different groups and we don't have meaning until we decide which one we bo- want to belong to and fall into line and commune with that thing. There's a... <clears throat> And Gladwell writes this book about outliers and how to be one. We think it's all great. And meanwhile, can, can I can I throw a, 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 another dimension into the stuff. same problem? Um, <laughs> Please, that's what well, we need more you know, complication. It is ultimately, anything worth discussing is complex, right? Um, yeah. Is this <laughs> helping to crack my seed open that I was talking but, about? But how about? You know, the, the, the idea of if looking through an evolutionary lens at the concept of progress. I, I'm a firm believer in, in the notion that any problem worth solving, any non-trivial problem, is only addressable through a process of evolutionary change. The notion that you can take a very complex system that is not even close to being fully described, whose properties are not well explained, and change it with predictable outcomes is an infantile one in my book. And so I accept, as a matter of epistemic epistemic humility, the notion that All problem solving is fundamentally an evolutionary game, a game of trial and error, of continuous conjecture and criticism. And it also gives me a hesitancy to pronounce too loudly Mm. about anything to do with society, culture, human bodies, immune systems, climates, uh, you name it, Any, any ecologies, you know, any of these wonderful, interesting things that we are surrounded by and that that is actually a statement that has a bearing on this group individual uh, dichotomy that we've been talking about 
Because without the diversity of conjecture, you, you don't get progress. Mm -hmm. You don't get the evolution happening. Yes. And so I say some things that upset people who describe themselves as progressives. I say you've lost touch with the meaning of this word. Uh, talk about this evolutionary construct and I say you need to be in the world of conjecture and criticism. So anything that centralizes, anything that decides for other people works away from progress. Because it's, it suppresses the mechanisms of conjecture and criticism of trial and error of error correction is suppressed by this overbearing centralization. So to have an evolutionary system, we need to um, admit dissent, diversity of opinion, not of any other dimension that you may care to get hung up upon. Um, and that would now be an argument that uh, drives more in Kate's direction. So my question to both of you is this. <laughs> Us right now, are we just free floating individuals at the end of the spectrum with, with no ties or no attachments, um, an unfettered individualism? and selfishness or are the three of us sitting here part of a group but not identical are we behaving fraternally and discussing things in a way where we don't agree about everything and that might actually help uh, our species to evolve <laughs> you know I was, I was thinking as well both of you were talking but initially when Nick was talking about evolution and whether or not that's a good thing, right? So there's a question about like, you know, a fact question about whether it's happening or not. And then there's a value question that's separate from that, you know, about whether or not that's a good thing. And um, I'm always trying, you know, to understand, I think I said this before, but I'm always trying to understand what people on the other side are thinking. And my immediate thought would be that, well, evolution is good in so far as we're approximating something better than what we have. You know, like we're aiming at change for the sake of change is not clearly good, but change which moves you away from less desirable circumstances towards something more desirable. And then what is the objective marker of that? Well, I don't, I mean, that's, I think, a different question. But if evolution is, um, if the belief that evolution is good is operating on the assumption that we are not already where it's at, we have not already attained a state of perfection. But I get the sense that those on the other side feel that at least in certain domains we have, or we're pretty darn close to it. So this feeling within, feeling is the right word, but within science, that it is beyond reproach right now. Mm -hmm. A fully mature you know, project. That it is. Um, and what's we're, that? we're just missing that little that little bit I of AI, so. right? We, we just need to tweak our species a little bit, and and so we will arrive. Why... So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think so. So I think that within like this idea of, of falsification, which um, needs to allow for opinions that are not identical. But now I think it has come to mean the opposite, which is that this theory that we hold has been proven to be perfect, proven to be beyond reproach. And so questions are no longer appropriate. That's why they're heretical, because you're taking us backwards, back through all that mud that we've already trudged through ah. to get to this apex that we're now at. So. If you believe, right, that you're in this state of perfection within science and maybe more broadly, I mean, it's hard, for, it's hard for me to believe that anyone could look at our political social situation and believe that we've attained a degree of perfection there. I mean, with all of the, you know, the hatred and the uncertainty and the suicides and, the, you know, all of that. But if within science we believe that we've achieved a state of perfection, then no longer is diversity valued because mm. diversity is just a collection of the right beliefs plus a whole mix of other ones. We've already so discounted all those other yeah, ones. At, so at, at some level, I, I find it just such an easy uh, concept to dismiss because I would say, are you suggesting there are no problems in the world? Um, 
And are you suggesting that the existing knowledge base is sufficient to solve them, no. you know, if there are some problems? To, to me, the existence of problems is, is uh, equivalent to a statement of the absence of required knowledge to solve them. Um, I got you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, this yeah. is not my view, right? But I think this is, this might be, you know, and I think that, I, I think maybe that some who hold this view would say that the only problems yeah. we have in the world are sort of application yes. problems or failure to conform problems. So on the vaccine issue, I mean, I think the idea is that um, yes. vaccines are perfect immunity makers. And if we just roll them out in the right way and people uptake them in the right way, we will eradicate all viral threats. So I think there is a sense, mm. right, that at least in that part of science, oh, what's the term you had, Nick? Yeah, uh, pretty mature, a pretty mature, a mature project. Yeah. Fully mature, I forget. Yeah, fully mature project. And so that, mm. yes, there are problems in the world, but it's just the problems yes, that have I, I to do with the I messiness. I think that's a pretty good summary. Um, although, yeah, as I say, I, I just, I, I can't see how any mature intellect would go too far with it, you know, not abandon it relatively quickly. Um, and, and just going back to you, at the beginning of this response, you, you said, you know, well, is evolution per se good? Is change per se good? Um, you know, what, what, what it is for me is, is new knowledge good? And I can, I can say yes. New knowledge must be good because without new knowledge, we can't solve our new problems, you know. Um, and we all want to solve our problems. Solving our problems must be good. Uh, the problems persisting can't be good. Uh, so, so I kind of look at it and I say, no, change per se is definitely not good. Me cut in half is a change that I would not want. Um, but uh, 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 <clears throat> and, and same, so the same thing with evolution. I mean, you could, you, you could, I suppose, entertain devolution or evolution that takes you into a state of fragility as a result of some external change that wasn't anticipated. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, per se, these things are not necessarily good. But I, I would suggest that if knowledge creation is fundamentally evolutionary, then, then the evolution is, is in that sense fundamentally good and and needs to be permitted so the idea that there are pockets of uh, of content or science or discipline some balkanized element of the world that is no longer permeable to new ideas because perfection has been attained and so uh, we, we should no longer uh, accept criticism or dissent that's what I find, I find uh, very, very, very challenging and, and not worth dwelling on for too long. Yeah. This, I, this idea, uh, this term, new knowledge, I wonder, you know, mm -hmm. those who hold this view that science is a perfectly mature system, I wonder, what would they say? They might, yeah. they might say there is no new knowledge. There is no possibility of new knowledge because if our system is perfectly mature and full and complete and knowledge mm. is just right. an awareness of certain facts about the world in a justified way. And that's why we need then, to merge then, with the machines. If our system is already complete, we mm. already have all of that. <laughs> so, if, if you're right. so if you're talking about knowledge, well, I've already got all that. But this yeah. idea of new it, knowledge, that's an oxymoron. I love, I, love, I love what you're doing here. I'm trying, you know, because I'm it's, trying it's to understand. You can... <laughs> on the whole discussion um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very engaging way. Um, th there's something there to do with uh, a demarcation problem. Because even such a person who, who regards, the, 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 you know, who takes the view that there is some neatly demarcated thing called science and all the scientific problems have been solved, whether they pertain to the body or the, the, the climate or whatever, okay. Um, but then outside of that, there are clearly social problems that have not been solved because those same people would be out there, you know, <laughs> saying uh, there's, we need to be include, we need to be a whole list of things that, that need to improve. We need, we need to be more sustainable, more inclusive, more whatever. Um, and uh, that, you know, that, 
that exercise of demarcating would be interesting to me. I, I, I kind of don't have a, a bright line demarcation. I, I don't really enjoy the categorization of or the dichotomy between science and society. To me, to me, there are very complex systems that are hard and, and there are the nuts that will be only cracked in millennia to come. Um, and those things are kind of in a group. They include everything to do with a human brain, anything to do with an ecology, you know. Um, and so we have these, this, thing, this domain we call science, which has, uh, you know, at its purest, is in, the, in, in such simple, deductive kind of areas that the problems are no longer interesting or they aren't, they, you know, they're not, they're not interesting at the reduced level anyway. Um, does that make any sense? That little rant, yeah. that little ramble. You know what I think of as well is like if you bring it back to the human level, right? Like the individual, and you just look at one person, like mm -hmm. there, it doesn't exist this point of perfection that you will arrive at, like n nor as a species or as a human being. You live your life, you decide how you want to live it. Some things happen that are out of your control and some things you can control, mostly the internal. And then you come to the end of your life and you don't really get to decide that either, you know, unless you want to get into assisted suicide or suicide or anything like that. You don't really get to decide. It's just how it goes. Mm. And, then, mm. and then you move on to the next generation and, and that's, that's what it is. There's not this point of arrival where suddenly it's like, my life is complete. I can die now. Like this is this is not how it works. So I don't think that, you know, that maybe the major flaw with progressivism is that there is no final destination. You know, it's the final destination in everything is death. And so it's it's death of ideologies as well. It's it's death of ideas. It's things that are, you know, and then reborn again. But it's all kind of going to end up being cyclical anyhow. This is the answer <laughs> to the myth of Sisyphus, right? Who's, yes, there is meaning, meaning that, yes, there is no meaning if you just see your life as a series of endless rolling the boulder up the hill tasks. But if you see your life as a series of choices you make in the face of that emptiness that so you you impregnate that life with meaning but it's not like uh perfection or bust right and i wonder if we're a bit caught in that now if we feel like you know i mean even with this um this virus situation like the idea that it's endemic or could be endemic <laughs> is horrible to people Never mind that it might be treatable and, and that you're not much at risk from it. But you mean we didn't eradicate it? Right. You mean I don't have a perfect And that's why they want to hold on to the mandates, totally. right? Because right. that's their way of and trying to control, exactly. right, the external. But, you, you know, the, the, the same most people... Perfection... Yeah. <laughs> and don't you How just does it arise? Because the same, the same people don't have right. a perfect bubble around themselves <laughs> with respect to car accidents or um, being caught cheating on their husbands. You know, um, the, 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 there's I an know. endless list of risks that people take. Um, and uh, why, why is there this obsession around some kind of uh, zero COVID uh, safety culture? Uh, for this? Well, I think part of it, yeah. Yeah, that's back a, to what we yeah. were talking about, is we've been told to care about yeah. this. And I think also, you know, as humans, we're, we're not great at self-awareness. Um, so, you know, yes, we embrace risk of all kinds all the time, but we don't have national campaigns about infidelity we have national campaigns yeah. about we used to we used to have mad drunk driving and that yeah. kind of you know that's but we right we're not being told to care about it yeah, but we don't care well, about hopefully that. everyone enjoying this program uh has also thoroughly enjoyed not, not being, being told, being told to what to think or how to think <laughs> <laughs> and you know these are the conversations uh <laughs> that that make my day brighter thank you guys so much this has been so I'm lovely I'm sorry you guys didn't have a glass of wine, that you're in the wrong time zone. I, if you want to fix that another time, I am, I am open to the idea of a midnight session on my 
Hard stop, 2 p.m. There we go.